heads up, cause you're in the hoodwood. I'm a black bandit KJ Green welcoming you to Sports from the Hoodwood for June 21st, 2019. Coming up this week, the Raps are the champs. Can they convince Kawhi to stay? Are they being traded to the Lakers? Or is he? Can the Lake Show build a super team now? Is technology ruining officiating in all sports? I have some thoughts on the NBA draft, that gas and head slap, and, and all sorts of madness mixed in this week for a summer healthy of the Hoodwood. Then let's go. You're tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for the most honest, unfiltered commentary and insight on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's Hoodwood's hometown hero, KJ Green. Green from the Hoodwood. Despite becoming summer solstice, it's still on. I'm just a warning that I'm following the animals that they decide to pair off and head for any kind of boat or art. My name is KJ Green, and I welcome you to another installation of this Hoodwood for this third week of June. This summer solstice, and all the days of shoulder and football season. But that's still a blip on the horizon. Let's wrap up the NBA championship, the NBA finals. The Toronto Raptors become the first Canadian team to win the NBA title. Defeating the Warriors, the defending two-time defending champion Warriors in six games. And let's face it, the Warriors were just done. I mean, let, let, let's just let's just be honest. Keep keep it honey on it. The Warriors were walking wounded. Kevin Durant was, you know, suffered a devastating injury. And it was it's basically been a wrap for the for the uh, Warriors when then Clay Thompson uh hurting his knee and he's suffering a devastating ACL injury. And if the the Warriors were just Steph Curry Dre Green, a partridge in a pear tree, and a bunch of uh, uh, stiffs from the Oakland East Bay. And not to take anything away from the Warriors, the Warriors were a great team. They had a uh, a great run. But after a while, you just knew they were done. You just saw the way they were playing and saw they were... The Warriors will still be a contender. I mean, with or without Kevin Durant, but Kevin Durant is basically ex nate for the whole next season for the 2019-20. Clay Thompson may not be back till at the very earliest March of 2020. So then you got Steph Curry, Dre Green, uh, and and a whole, and a cast of nobodies. They went from bully of the West to a bunch of teams. In the West, looking for them to kick their ass. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of teams that are gonna be looking for the Warriors and wanting to get some get back. And you have to think about this: the West is going to be absolutely loaded next year. I mean, you have your usual suspects in Houston, Oklahoma City, up and comers like Denver, Utah. The Clippers are always going to be a team to deal with. And the Lakers, and we'll talk about them coming up. The Blazers. I mean, that's a man's, man's, man's world out west. The Warriors are going to have a bullseye on their back and a lot of teams looking for get back. Now, with the Raptors, they have problems of their own. Yes, they've won the title. They will be looking to defend that title. But can they convince Kawhi Leonard, their knight in shining armor, if you will, to stay in Toronto and defend that title? I don't think he wants to stay in Toronto. I think he was glad that they did right by him, didn't try to wear him out, didn't do any back-to-backs on him. I didn't know Kawhi Leonard would play 60 games this year. But still, he was the man that the Raptors needed to put them over the top. He was the player who said, look, I've been here before. I know how to win a championship. 
follow me. Yes, he was recalcitrant, not a good interview, very quiet, but he did his, he let his play do the talking. And the Raptors followed his lead and won games that last year, year before, years previous, that they wouldn't have won. No real knock against DeMar DeRozan or Kyle Lowry. Intestinal fortitude for games was sometimes lacking. It didn't hurt that LeBron James their you and their usual bullies in Cleveland were out of the mix, out of the way. That the supposed rise of Boston never materialized that this team in Boston that was supposed to be a contender for the title and a chic pick to win the East, if not give the Warriors a real battle for the NBA title, were out of the way. That young rising teams like the Sixers and Bucks were not ready to make that next step to elite status. No knock against Giannis Antetokounmpo, who I think will be will win the MVP. No knock against the Sixers, Joel Embiid being the fine player he is. And you know I'm a knock Ben Simmons, so I don't think he's that good. But the East was a lot easier for Toronto to negotiate with teams weakened. You have some teams weakened and some teams that weren't ready to make that next step. Toronto was ready. Kawhi Leonard showed them away. And give them the credit and respect that is due. They won the title. They didn't fluke it up. They didn't need any late uh, lucky shots. Kawhi Leonard put the wraps on his back, won the title, won finals MVP. And now he is in an extreme position of power and flexibility. He could stay in Toronto and be a basketball icon up north for the next four or five years, taking the Supermax. Well, it's not the Supermax, but the Raps can offer him the most money. He can stay in Toronto, be a living legend in Toronto, and keep the Raps as a power broker in the East for the next half decade. He could decide he wants to go back to the SoCal roots and go to the Clippers. They are poised to throw money at him. And if the Clippers get Kawhi, the equations change heavily in the West. The Clippers, not the Lakers, would be the power team in LA, despite the moves that they're making. And what of what where he would go? Suppose he goes, throws a wild card and goes to the Knicks. Seems like the Knicks are always the dark horse stalker for every every player, every free agent. But Kawhi in New York is unrealistic. They don't have the pieces to build around. Yes, they drafted R.J. Barrett tonight. The Knicks, in their ultimate fantasy, would have won the lottery, drafted Zion Williamson, tr- attracted someone like a KD, or Kawhi, this is before KD got hurt, and made the kind of moves to jump up up in the East. Now, the Knicks are still holding out for some free agent to come to them. But with KD and Clay both hurt, free agent now is Kawhi Leonard. And I seriously doubt that Kawhi Leonard will want to go to New York. Best case scenario, I think he stays in Toronto and continues to make the Raptors the power team in the East. With, I think, Boston falling off. New Jersey still not... Did I say New Jersey? Lord help me. Brooklyn not ready to make that step. Philly and Milwaukee will be able to push Toronto, but as the defending champs, they will have cards. Going to L.A., might be the best emotional pick for Kawhi, but the Clippers still have yet to prove they can win deep in the postseason. And with the West being as big a minefield as it is, the Clippers 
will need at least 50 wins to get up to get into the playoffs. I'm thinking a team in the West can can win. I should say, I think a team in the West could only make the playoffs by winning 50 games, and that's going to be a tough deal in itself. We will take our first time out of the day. Come back, talk about the Titanic trade that is happening between the Lakers and the Pels. Or is it? Did the Lakers and the Pelicans mess the math up? And this AD trade might not go through after all. Sports from the Littlewood comes back with more after this. You're tuned into Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's foremost location for no nonsense commentary, insight, and opinions on the world of sports. Here now, live in living color, black by popular demand, your host, KJ Green. You are back in the Hoodwood. My name is KJ Green, and we will continue to talk about who and if you thought I was going to let this week go without talking about the mammoth. AD to LA trade, you really don't know me in the hood. Anthony Davis was in principle traded as the New Orleans Pelicans agreed to trade Anthony Davis of Los Angeles Lakers in exchange for a point guard Lonzo Ball, which made the VAR Ball's head swell up and explode. No, actually, no, it didn't, but I'll talk about him later. Small forward Brandon Ingram, small forward Josh Hart, and four. Count them four first round picks. Now the Lakers um traded those picks. One of those picks, the New Orleans Pelicans subsequently turned right around and traded to the Atlanta Hawks to get their eighth pick. And that pick, the Hawks turned right around with this pick and drafted DeAndre Hunter. Now, I'm thinking the Hawks are laughing like loons because they may be the benefactor of this. They also picked up Cam Reddish as the 10th pick. New Orleans took Jackson Hayes with the pick they swapped with the the Hawks. This is fascinating in so many myriads of ways. The Pelicans, who as expected, took Zion Williamson with the first pick, now have a young core of promising players. I still don't like Lonzo Ball. I, I'm I'm convinced he is a horrible shooter. But he's a decent facilitator and, and, and good on ball defender. If he can get his daddy issues out of the way and start playing with a little bit of passion and and, and panache, this sets the Pellies up for a really, really solid run with a good young core of players. I mean, Zion Williamson, Jackson Hayes, not to mention, you've got players like Ball, Ingram, Hart, guys really, really fast. This team comes together, they're going to be very, very dangerous. This year is going to be, be really hard because it's going to be a lot of growing pains. But this team will be fun to watch. And they will not have the whole cloud of is Anthony Davis staying or going. That's long gone out the window. The problem here now is the whole pyramid of trades that are going on contingent on Anthony Davis waiving his roster bonus or his signing bonus of $4.1 million so the trade can be fully consummated. If the trade's fully consummated, then they have that second max slot that they've wanted, and they and their and the Lakers have been 
busy the whole week trying to basically free up roster spots and free up positions so they can create this max salary slot so they can be able to acquire Anthony Davis because with the rules of the game the way it is, the Lakers need these contracts moved to come within 125% of Anthony Davis' salary, which would be the difference between $23.7 million and $32.5 million in the space when the trade is finalized on July 6th. Keep in mind that Saturday, July 6th. Now, me, I'm going to probably be lit up drunk somewhere, not really paying attention. But that weekend is going to be big because this trade ha- will be finalized on July 6th. Now, the Lakers are trying to finagle it to wait till July 30th to have the maximum cap space if they can't get the players cleared of the roster and incentivize or incentivize New Orleans to delay the completion of the trade. If Davis doesn't waive his $4.1 million trade bonus, the Lakers Pelicans trade wouldn't even be allowed. Even if the Lakers find a third team for the players not included in the original deal with New Orleans. This whole messy math is further proof that the boondoggle that the Lakers is, is much more the shit show than we ever really thought. Consider this. The Lakers are gutting their roster. With the exception of Kyle Kuzma and LeBron James. Kyle Kuzma, LeBron James, the only team that are, only Lakers that are on, that were on the team's end of season roster. The Lakers basically gutted their team and many wonder if it's going to, if the Lakers are going to be AD, Braun, and 10 stiffs. And many people, oh, you got that. Uh, Why can't they get Kawhi Leonard? Kawhi Leonard's not coming to the Lakers. Kawhi Leonard is just not going to want to be a part of a team full of dysfunction. The Lakers are a mess. Got himself into a ginormous mess. The Lakers have been are offering contracts of everybody. He's just throwing, I mean, just Mo Wagner, uh, Jamario Jones, Isaac Bonga, they're basically having a fire sale to get rid of players, free up cap space, and have Brian and Anthony Davis together, and then try to fill the roster out with original players and hope that they can carry, these two teams can carry them to the playoffs, if not deeper. It's a foolish, foolish thought by the Lakers. What looked to be a bold trade is going to look more like a snickerdoodle on one side. The Pels are set up for a bright future. The Lakers have Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and not much else. And you look at that team and wonder how are they going? What kind of new math are they going to try to be able to pull a, pull out to make this all work? This is just messy. Not only did the Lakers give up what seemed to be a king's ransom for Anthony Davis, they also gave up draft picks. They also gave up future flexibility. They gave away so much to get one player. And now the pressure is going to be all on Anthony Davis to deliver. And Anthony Davis, what has he won in this league? Honestly, I mean, is Anthony Davis a great player? Without question. Anthony Davis and LeBron James will make the Lakers very, very relevant in the West. 
Will it win them a title? No, not even close. Now, can they be able to restructure and build on for other players to try to attract? Maybe a Jimmy Butler? That's going to take some creative math. That's going to tra- create take some creative cooking. And then, even then, the Lakers still will lack critical depth on their bench to be able to challenge the Golden State, which a weakened Golden State, possibly a stronger L.A. Clippers. Not to mention Houston, Oklahoma City, Portland, Utah, Denver. It's a man's man's world in the West. And two players, even of Anthony Davis's and LeBron James's caliper, that Nicole gonna smile ain't gonna get you jack shit in the West. It's not gonna work. We'll take a time out, come back with more Sports from the Hoodwood rolls on after this. Tuned in to Sports from the Hoodwood, the internet's premier location for no nonsense commentary, insight, and opinion on the world of sports. Here now, the man with 100% certified fresh taste, your host, KJ Green. Back in the Hoodwood, my name is KJ Green. Thank you so much for joining me this week. They always say the eye of the sky does not lie with the technology afforded to the various sports and sporting venues, there are a lot more angles to be able to watch a game now than there ever was before. If you ever watch a film of an old football or baseball game and you wonder sometimes how we watch baseball games without the stats in the corner, you can turn on any baseball game now and you'll be able to see the score, count, who's on, who's up, what their average is, in a glance. And to think that a lot of leagues and sports entities did not want this informational box, scared that it would not it would drive away viewers rather than attract them to a game. But now with the information it is and the way the uh, camera is now, you see more of the game. And seeing more of the game means there are more second guessings of the game. Bang, bang, play at the plate. A shot uh, being goaltend or not. Man in or out. The officials are now being even more second guessed and corrected by technology. And the question is, is it ruining the game? Is it taking the human element out of the game? And it's weird because you look at it from a purely a purely sports standpoint. You want to make sure that all the games are fair. That the calls are all right. And that the officiating is to regulate and police the game and not be so much of a factor of the game that they affect the outcome. And the St. Louis Blues railed long and hard about the supposed hand pass or passes that the San Jose Sharks affected on them that was not caught by replay and not subject to any kind of oversight. Via a replay. Now, didn't really affect the Blues. They ended up winning the Stanley Cup title. But there have been so many instances where an instant replay or some sort of video oversight will be able to correct egregious plays. The Saint, the uh, uh, the New Orleans Saints are still carping long and loud about a pass interference call that was not called. Now the NFL, I feel, is an 
an enormous amount of reactionary mentality is now going to be able to look at past interferences in replay. That's going to come under the scope of instant replay, which I think is incredibly stupid, very short-sighted. Now, was the Saints receiver interfered with in the NFC Championship game? Without question, he was. It was an egregious miss by the official. But it wasn't subject to any kind of replay interpretation and was not able to go back on. But that's the human element of the game. This game, it isn't like you're playing a video game. You're not playing with computer figures and a reset button that you can hit. This is human beings, a human element. And when you get right down to it, that's what makes the games the game. Games being played by two teams and being officiated by these same humans. Are you going to put a camera and an eye in the sky to catch everything? You want referees to be interpreters of the rules, policemen on the field. They're not going to be perfect. They're not going to get everything right. To expect them to be perfect and get everything right is folly. To expect referees and officials to see every play, every foul, every transgression is foolish. Now, does replay have a place in the game? Of course it does. There are some instances where a judgment call cannot be made by human eyes at the time. I saw a play not too long ago where player hits a line drive into left field. It gets over the fence, but at first blush, it looked like it hit the top of the fence and bounced back hard. The instant replay of the game saw that the ball had indeed landed above the fence and ricocheted back onto the field of play. The, the call was corrected and the player and said player was awarded the right to rifle home run. There have been times where replay really could have corrected an otherwise missed call. Long time NFL advocates of, of instant replay held back to a Pittsburgh Steelers Houston Oilers playoff game in the mid 70s where a receiver by the name of Mike Ranfro caught a pass skidding out of the back of the end zone. He had established possession. He had both feet down, and he landed on his butt, skidding backward in the end zone. The referee called him out of bounds, disallowed the touchdown. Replays showed that he was indeed in bounds. They need that kind of correction. They need that kind of oversight to overturn egregious misses. Not judgment calls. Not things that would be subject to interpretation. Too much reliance on technology will make the game more robotic. Too much reliance on technology will hurt the game. And that it does not need to do. That's not the final word from the wood. It only sounds like it. We'll take our final time out, come back with some quick hits, along with fat dab head slap, and the final word from the wood. Of course, from the hood wood, head down the home stretch after this.
You're tuned into Sports from the Hoodwood, the Internet's foremost location for the most honest insight and opinion on the world of sports. Now, once again, here's the man of the hour after hours, your host, K.J. Green. Rounding third and headed for home here in the Hoodwood. Wrap up the week with the fat dap head slap. And the final word from the Wood, fat dap of the week going to Florida State coach Mike Martin, who will be retiring after 40 years as the Seminoles head coach after the uh, Noles were, uh, they took their second loss in the College World Series. Mike Martin retires as the winningest head baseball coach in NCAA history and the winningest coach of any sport with over 2,000 wins. It's a shame that none of those wins led to a national title. 40 uh, years coaching, 17 College World Series appearances, but never did finish on top in Omaha. Nevertheless, fat dapped Mike Martin for an extraordinary career. Of the week goes to the overzealous deputy in Oakland in the in Oracle Arena after the Toronto Raptors won the 2019 NBA Finals and pandemonium was everywhere. Players and coaches and all sorts of dignitaries were rushing the floor and the general manager of the Raptors, Missouri or Jury, was trying to get to the floor and was forcibly stopped by an Alameda County uh, Alameda try it again an Alameda County Sheriff who did not know who Missouri was now I would know the guy if I if I saw him straight up but he had a pass he had a badge he was who he was The cop decided he wanted to hold him up. The jury tried to get out of his way. And the cop gave him a two-handed shove. There were assault charges that were filed. And this looked like this could be an international incident. There are people who are saying that the cop didn't identify the right people and was just trying to pull a power play. I think possibly there was a little saltiness going on there. The Warriors were defeated in the, on their home turf, and for the second time in four years, a visiting team was celebrating an NBA Finals title on their floor. And I think the 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 county cop just didn't want to see all these players and dignitaries celebrating on his floor, so he decided to get a little. Um, side revenge it was stupid but still it happened it slapped the Alameda County cop who thought a little too much of himself and damaged his standing without further ado we will go ahead and move to the final word from the wood now, I think she start off this week's final word with a caveat. I grew up in Cincinnati at the tail end of Pete Rose's story career. His free agent defection happened in 1979 from Cincinnati to Philadelphia when I was still a young boy. And his return to Cincinnati five years later came the summer before I started junior high. He was banned from baseball a week before I started my senior year in high school in 1989. Now, Pete Rose is nothing short of a legend in Cincinnati, born, raised, and professionally bred in the baseball town, a player who parlayed his marginally decent skills into a pure hitter with hard work and pure desire, a player who took the intended derisive nickname given to him of Charlie Hustle because he ran to first after a walk in a spring training game, made it part of his personality and persona. A player who was, and in some respects, is still so competitive. He bowled over Ray Fossey to win an all-star game. He will still tell you facts that he was on the winning side more time than any player in baseball, 
with 1,972 wins. He has more safe hits than anyone in baseball and on the field was considered the model of grit, toughness, and, well, hustle. That being said, I'm not much of a fan of his, though his work ethic and knowledge of hitting, hitters, and approach to hitting is admirable. I thought him a world-class jerk, someone who thought more of himself and thinks that he was bigger than the game. It took Rose 15 years to finally admit that he bet on baseball, something that he steadfastly denied for years. He was banished from the game by then MLB commissioner Bart Giamatti for conduct detrimental to the game. Jim Gray, a widely respected reporter, was lambasted when he badgered Rose about his banishment from the game during the reveal of the All-Century team in 1999. Now, was Gray wrong? I think his timing may have been wrong, but he was not wrong to ask the questions. But I digress. Rose denied betting on the game until a 2004 interview with Charles Gibson. And he did this only to sell a book. His defenders steadfastly maintained that he always bet to win and that betting on his team was the ultimate competitiveness. He believed he could win every game and bet accordingly. But it was proven that he did not bet the Reds every day. And when he didn't, when he didn't bet on the Reds, he was, in a sense, betting against his team. I ran book one time and there was no bigger red flag than if someone who regularly bets on someone or a team decided not to bet. As a manager, he had access to info that most bettors would not. And bookies, good bookies, they know all of the angles. If they see a noted better not betting, they will want to know why. And either that and send out word that a key better is not betting his usual bet and back off. Rose maintained his innocence, but I've always retorted, had Rose been innocent, He would have fought any and all charges against him. He would have not accepted any kind of plea. Guilty men don't fight. And innocent men don't plea bargain or compromise. Had Rose truly been innocent, yet lacking capital for defense, you can bet there would have been a line of lawyers and attorneys willing to work on the cheap, if not for free, if just to have the honor of defending the hit king. Rose is out of the game for a reason and has been out of the game, special occasion accepted, for the past 30 years. The Reds had to ask permission to retire his number and bring him back to Great American Ballpark to honor him. Rose is not allowed to be in any ballpark unless he is in a paid seat. Now the Reds have had various functions for the vaunted Big Red Machine and other number retirements and inductions into their Team Hall of Fame. And Rose has been allowed to attend, but these have been few and far between. Rose has railed about not being able to be involved in teaching red hitters how to hit and how to develop young hitters and that his vast knowledge could be used for the betterment of the game. He claims to be an ambassador or the best ambassador for the game. But in that same breath, he throws former teammates under the bus. Rose claimed that had it not been for him, Johnny Bench, as revered and respected or read as the definition is allowed, wouldn't have been the Hall of Famer had it not been for him being on base ahead of him so many times for him to drive in runs. The fact that Bench had more of the RBIs than Rose did in a much shorter career, retired the team's all-time home run leader, and the home run leader for catchers, since surpassed by Carlton Fisk, and had more Grand Slams than Rose, shouldn't really matter, though. He just wasn't that good of a player. The fact remains that Rose made his own bet. He bet on baseball and was booted from the game for it, and then lied about it for several years until he needed to come clean to make a buck. His sordid actions sullied the game. I, for one, have no use for Rose. His railings and ramblings come across as the whinings of a bitter old man who the game has passed by long ago. And that is the final word from the wood. 
With the music coming up in the background, you know that means your time in the Hoodwood is just about done. And I thank you so much for your visit this week. If you want to drop me a line, drop me an email, you are more than welcome to. The email from the show is kjgreen at blackbandproductions.com. You can send emails on show topics, questions, comments, and yes, criticism. You're welcome to correspondence and try to respond to every email in a timely manner. You can catch this podcast on a number of sites, including iTunes and Google Play. The show site is self at speedwoodsports.podbean.com. I'm also on Facebook at Black Bandit Productions and Enterprises. I'm also on Twitter as well at KJGreen20 and KJGreen20 as well as YouTube. So, that's that, fellow sports fans. Until next time out in the hood world, I'm KJGreen. Sports from the hood world is a Black Bandit Productions.